Hi everyone. Uh, really exciting to see so many people here to hear about Salvia. Uh, it's the, apparently the first time uh, there's been a Salvia talk in the past two breaking conventions, um, which is really exciting. So great to be here. Thanks for coming. Can everyone hear me okay? No? no? Okay, I'll need to learn to speak loudly for once. Okay. Uh, so a little bit of background about myself. I'm a writer. I've been writing in the psychedelic space for about five years about science and culture. My background is as a biologist. I'm a, a research scientist. I have degrees in both uh, neuroscience and regenerative medicine. Salvia was the first psychedelic I ever tried, the first psychedelic I ever wrote about, and uh, it's really exciting to be here to talk about it. I'm going to be talking about the wheel. So salvia is a, a perennial plant in the mint family. Uh, it's in the salvia divinorum, is in the salvia genus, uh, which is the largest genus of the mint family. It includes plants like common sage, salvia officinalis. Salvia divinorum means diviner's sage. It uh, grows with these big green leaves and uh, lovely purple white flowers. Uh, it grows in uh, one very small region of the world, this uh, northeastern tip of Oaxaca in Mexico and has been used by the Mazatec people as a plant medicine uh, for hundreds and hundreds of years. The Mazatec word for it is Shkar Pastora, meaning uh, the leaves of the shepherdess. One of the Spanish names is Yerba de Maria. So clearly there are Christian themes and like many of the plant medicines in Mesoamerica, uh, the Mazatec people took on uh, Christian influence to survive the persecution of the colonists, basically. So we don't know for how long before colonization salvia was used traditionally, but we know that it took on a lot of Christian elements, like, like many other plant medicines. Um, the salvias, salvia is grown in secretive groves in, uh, in Mazatec culture, although here Hamilton Morris got uh, his hands on some. Uh, the plant is used to treat uh, all sorts of physical problems. It can be prescribed. Uh, you know, eat a few leaves before bed. It can be used to treat things like uh, gut problems, inflammation, eczema, arthritis, menstrual cramps, cystitis, really the list goes on and on. Um, for more uh, serious uh, uh, conditions, uh, maybe spiritual conditions, you might require a one-on-one -on -one healing with a shaman, uh, which takes place overnight. The leaves are eaten fresh usually, or uh, made into a juice and drunk uh, with the guidance of the shaman. Lots of Christian imagery, as you can see here, there's usually a statue of the Virgin Mary. The leaves are thought to bring forth the spirit of the Virgin Mary. Uh, this experience, the, the sort of eaten or ingest, this ingesting salvia in this way, this experience lasts several hours. Uh, can be quite gentle, but can also be quite profound. I'd recommend checking out Hamilton Morris's uh, Vice documentary on salvia for an example of uh, how beautiful the experience can be. The shaman is there doing energy work, singing, chanting, uh, all this kind of thing. So it's a very gentle experience. In Mazatec culture, salvia is considered the more gentle of the, uh, of the plant medicines, of the entheogenic plant medicines. Usually it's the plant medicine that shamans train on initially, followed by morning glory seeds and then psilocybin mushrooms are considered the hardest to manage. So salvia has a, a rather gentle reputation among Mazatec people. This is in contrast to the way we take salvia in the West, which is uh, with dried plant material, often made into concentrated extracts with bongs or pipes. Uh, the experience is extremely short-lived. Uh, usually you lose complete control of the body. There's a lot of confusion, mumbling incoherently, uh, terror maybe, and uh, you often get this thousand yard stare at the end of it where you know, people kind of regret what, they, what they've done. Uh, so this is a really... <laughs> This is a really short-lasting experience, very different to the, the uh, experience of salvia in, in the Mazatec uh, tradition. And these kind of videos are kind of what we've been, how we've seen salvia in the West, or especially how psychedelic naive people have seen salvia in the West. And although this video in particular is satirical and is a joke, uh, videos like this, and including this one, have been used in court cases in the US to justify the prohibition of salvia. So hopefully this paints uh, you know, the, the difference between traditional use and contemporary use. I'm going to be focusing on the trip reports from contemporary Western users just because that's where we have the most information. But keep that in mind as I'm going on. This is the smoked salvia experience, which can be quite different from the Mazatec. Uh, so there are, like with, with most psychedelics, there are themes of the psychedelic experience that's unique to this particular psychedelic. With salvia, they're particularly easy to draw out from trip reports. One of the most prevalent themes is the wheel. Uh, people seem to quite often report a feeling of cyclical motion or seeing a rotating object or feeling like they're becoming part of a moving object. 
Uh, so here are some quotes from some different trip reports. These are all from different people, but they all have similar themes. I remember looking at a gigantic spiraling wheel. It seemed like a giant wheel that I could both see and feel. My head felt like it was mounted on a large pinwheel. It looked like a long rotating cylindrical candy cane. I cannot stress how massive this wheel seemed. It was the source of reality as we know it. It is responsible for creating the universe around us. So, kind of scary. The, a similar theme to this cyclical motion is uh, the theme of pages. People often feel like they're seeing a book or becoming pages on a book as, as they're turning. They often feel like the pages represent slices of reality. They can sometimes be, become part of the page. Uh, this can often be quite terrifying if it involves your, your whole self being created and destroyed with each flip of the page. Here are some examples. Each instant of reality is a page of the flip book and the previous page is destroyed and replaced with a new one. It was like the pages of a book being flipped, a seemingly endless array of pages. Another one, deja vu. Uh, people feel like they've been here before. They have a strong sense of familiarity, uh, like this is a, a truth that they've forgotten. Uh, and I was filled with deja vu. I knew I'd been here before. It felt like I'd always been there. An incredibly strong feeling of deja vu, but more than just a feeling, an absolute knowledge of knowing this all before, of having been this forever and just now realizing it again. This is associated with fear a lot of the time. Uh, people don't, you know, don't like their self being destroyed and they also don't like feeling like they've forgotten something really important. Uh, I literally realized I was alive and this was a very scary thought. Yeah. <laughs> Everything I'd ever known was ripped away from me. My entire consciousness was ripped from my body. I felt an intense feeling of terror that I was trapped there, that I'd always been trapped there. Naturally, I was horrified. So this gives you a bit of a flavor of the quality of the Western smoked salvia experience. I've also done a little bit of science to try and back this up because I know that might not be convincing for everyone. So I did a word frequency analysis with 100, 100 randomly selected reports for LSD, ketamine, and salvia. All these concepts to do with cyclical uh, ideas, the wheel cycle, pages, book, accordion, zipper, they all come up so much more frequently in salvia trip reports compared to others. When we look at movement, although people are less, uh, less likely to mention general terms to do with movement with salvia, they are more likely to get specific about the kind of movement they're experiencing. And pulling is the most frequently mentioned type of movement, which has a really involuntary feel to it. Uh, and then if we look more into the kinds of movement people are talking about suddenly, although that could be due to the mode of ingestion, uh, repeated, again, that cyclical concept, uh, forward and backwards, people are more specific about whether they're moving forward or backward on salvia, and twisting and spinning are things that come up a lot as well. So the uniqueness of the salvia experience is mirrored somewhat by the pharmacology. Salvinorin A is uh, the most potent naturally known, uh, natu known naturally occurring hallucinogen, only 200 micrograms required for an active dose. Uh, it contains uh, no nitrogen, so it's not an alkaloid, which is unusual for a psychedelic molecule. It also has no activity at serotonin receptors, which is also very unusual for a psychedelic molecule. Um, it has a little bit of activity at dop on the dopamine system, uh, but mostly it binds to one receptor, the kappa opioid receptor, and it binds very strongly. Here it is sitting in there. And uh, there are four types of opioid receptors. Uh, you've got the pain receptors in the periphery, then you've got mu, delta, and kappa. Mu and delta are to do with the typical euphoric effects of uh, opioids, and kappa is associated with something quite the opposite, dysphoria, which is aversion, confusion, discomfort, um, and it's thought that this receptor is involved in the withdrawal symptoms we get when we're withdrawing from opioids. The kappa opioid receptor is found across the brain, but mainly in the clostrum. This is a, a thin strip of matter in the brain. Uh, almost all the neurons in the clostrum have kappa opioid receptors on them. Uh, the thing that's important about the clostrum is it takes inputs from very important brain areas. The prefrontal cortex, emotion and awareness, the motor cortex, our experience of how we're moving, and the visual cortex. Um, and this led, uh, has led some people to suggest uh, that the clostrum might have a really important role in pulling together all these, these disparate parts of consciousness into one apparently coherent experience of consciousness. We have some studies to back this up as well. The most interesting one 
is uh, this case study from a few surgeons who were performing deep brain stimulation on a uh, sufferer of epilepsy. They stimulated a small area of the colostrum. The patient inst instantly lost consciousness, but kept their eyes open and sometimes muttered nonsense words. If they, were repeat if they were performing a repetitive task before the stimulation, such as tapping their fingers or repeating a word, they would continue doing this during the stimulation, but gradually taper off. And they would have no memory of, of what was happening during the stimulation afterwards. Uh, so this is the first time that scientists have seen the stimulation of such a, the shutdown of such a small brain area have such a significant effect on consciousness without also causing anesthesia because the patient was still able to move around and, and say things. Um, so this suggests that salvia basically is shutting down our colostrum, if that's the way it works, if it's activating the kappa opioid receptors which are mostly attached to inhibitory neurons in the colostrum and shutting it down, it's absolutely disrupting consciousness in a way we haven't seen before. But you know, this is a physicalist interpretation, this is a pharmacological interpretation. The idea that salvinorin A is, is shutting down the colostrum is a, nice, is a nice sort of chain of cause and effect, but really it lacks explanatory power of, of our phenomenological experience of the wheel unless you're a hardcore physicalist. And I'm not a hardcore physicalist, so let's go into the experience of the wheel a little bit more. When we think of a terrifying cosmic wheel, a lot of us might think of the wheel of life and death in Buddhism or samsara. Uh, which is the sort of wheel of suffering that we're all destined to be a part of, grasping, striving, wandering. Uh, Alan Watts calls it the prototype for all vicious circles. Um, and although our sort of common interpretation of this in the West is that this is, represents rebirth over the course of a life, it's also present in each moment. It's everywhere. It's all-encompassing in every moment. Uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, also, movement is really important uh, when we're talking about samsara, and this is relevant to salvia because movement comes up so often. Uh, I just want to read a tiny little extract from this book by Alexandra David Neal and Lama Yongden. The tangible world is movement, not a collection of moving objects, but movement itself. There are no objects in movement. It is the movement which constitutes the objects which appear to us. They are nothing but movement. That's how important this concept of movement is in, in Buddhist philosophy. Samsara also comes up in Hinduism. Uh, so uh, Nataraja, the lord of the dance, is uh, Lord Shiva uh, dancing in the, in the circle of Samsara, uh, holding the fire of creation and destruction in one hand, the drum which beats out the rhythm of time in the other, dancing on the demon of ignorance and encouraging us to watch them and dance with the same peace and joy that they do. Uh, this is a lovely quote from Island by Aldous Huxley. Shiva plays for the sake of playing like a child, but the playground is conscious. The dance floor is capable of suffering. So uh, both samsara appears in both Buddhism and Hinduism, but the, the idea of liberation from samsara is different in both these, these religions. In Hinduism, we have moksha, which uh, means uh, bliss uh, or, or pleasure. Uh, and this is about really stepping into the self, uh, seeing yourself as a player in the eternal play. And really, it's about self-actuation and really stepping into that role as an actor. Uh, whereas in Buddhism, nirvana is very different. Although moksha is a word uh, in Buddhism, nirvana is a very different concept. And it's about realizing the uh, illusion of self, that there is no self. It's very much about embracing no self and the inherent emptiness in all phenomena. And uh, in Mahayana Buddhism, especially nirvana and samsara are the same thing. They're interchangeable. To, uh, appreciate nirvana, you have to also uh, learn that samsara is all-encompassing and inescapable. So these, these uh, two major Eastern religions have the concept of samsara woven very deeply into them. This doesn't really come up in Western religions so much, but there is one interesting occurrence in the Hebrew Bible. Ezekiel has a vision of God and sees God's chariot and sees it pulled by wheels, which he calls ophanim, which he describes as being able to move in all directions at once. He describes them as made of glittering topaz and having the rims lined with eyes. It's a very psychedelic concept. Uh, and you may be familiar with the Flammarion engraving, which is supposed to demonstrate the, the someone reaching past the veil of our normal perception and seeing the cosmic machinery at work behind the scenes. And uh, Camille Flammarion, a biblical scholar, chose the ophanim to represent the cosmic machinery. So, I'll take a breath. So far, we've looked at the salvia experience in our West, uh, Western smoked context. Uh, and how these the, the sort of same unique themes are, seem to be a, apparent in Eastern religions as well. So let's look at one other place where these kind of same the same themes that we're seeing in Salvia experience are coming up. Um, and important to note as well that the, a lot of the people, presumably, who have this kind of experience, don't have any experience with Eastern religions. Although this is that's a speculation. I wouldn't say, say that for sure, but presumably most of them 
that don't understand what samsara is, and this is coming from somewhere else. Uh, so I want to talk about near-death experiences at the wheel. <coughs> Again, no drugs involved. Uh, this first, uh, so I'm going to read a couple of small extracts. This first is from someone who was knocked out during a hazing ritual in the military. Suddenly I felt as, I've been, as, I've, as if I'd been given access to the total knowledge of the universe. I stared at a huge dark wheel containing stars and other celestial bodies which slowly revolved. The second one is from a child who, uh, well, a childhood memory of someone who woke up too early during surgery. I could clearly see a mandala. This wheel rotated very slowly, and I had the feeling that this wheel could not be stopped no matter what. A very solid, slow, relentless movement. And then I have one from someone who experienced a heart attack. I rode with the universe of God in the wheel of life, and I became a spoke in the wheel. The universe was the center. There were billions of us rolling through the universe and experiencing without emotions, fear, or judgment. And then I have one more near-death experience, which I'm going to go into in a little bit more depth. It's very long, so I'm only going to take some very short extracts from it, but I'd re highly recommend reading the whole thing. It's partly what inspired this talk. Uh, this is someone who's had no history of psychedelics. He's an atheist, no history of spiritual practices, uh, has a normal job, uh, is driving to work one morning, turns left at a busy intersection, and suddenly notices a car coming towards him very, very quickly. And as soon as the car's about to hit him, he describes something very strange happening. Uh, time seems to stop, and he notices an object approaching him from behind. Uh, he initially thinks it seems to be about the size of a building, but as it grows closer, uh, he realizes it's bigger than he thought. The object resembled a giant water wheel lying on its side and rotating as it approached me. It was larger than we think of as the world. A kind of sensation came over my person, and I knew exactly what this thing was. I had seen the object before I was born, and I will see it again when I die. That was why I was seeing it now because I was in the process of dying in a fatal car crash. He described the, fill, the paddles of the wheel hitting him and feeling like he was being transported through different po possible realities. I understood that I was about to be subjected to the process approximated with reincarnation. This was why the wheel had come. I represented a kind of discrepancy that had to be fixed. There was no continuous me that traveled unaltered through the wheel. The very idea of a continuous self was contradicted by this experience. I'd like to point out this is very reminiscent of some of the salvia experiences you read, and of course the Buddhist philosophy of the illusion of self. Uh, I think at this point he realized that he had some a measure of control over where he would end up on the wheel, uh, or in, when kicked back out of the wheel, uh, but realized that if he died soon, he'd just end up right back in there very quickly. I saw variations of possible world outcomes where I died in the crash, the wheel didn't seem bothered one way or the other. All it cared about was sorting me. And there was a kind of ruthlessness to this that I will not soon forget. And the ruthlessness and relentlessness of the wheel are themes that come up a lot. So after this, he found himself back on the highway uh, without, with no apparent reason. And the driver and the car that was about to hit him nowhere to be seen. He has no explanation for why this happened. So I want to try and pull this all together now. Uh, and this is very speculative. So. I apologize if you don't like this. Um, I think Salvia is pointing to some fundamental truth, or it's a root to a fundamental truth, one root of many to a fundamental truth. And it's a truth that we're finding especially difficult to grasp if you judge it by the way people react to the smoked Salvia experience, myself included. Um, it makes me think that Salvia might be something of a touchstone for us, for these concepts of impermanence, the illusion of self, uh, the, you know, loss of ego, all these things. Um, it makes me think of Ram Dass's guru, and I ap apologize if you've heard this story before, but uh, Ram Dass decided to give his guru a couple of large doses of LSD, and really there wasn't much effect. He just laughed at me. Uh, on the second dose, uh, Ram Dass pushed uh, his guru for an, an answer. And uh, the guru said, for, for, to take this substance and to have no effect, your mind must be firmly fixed on God. Others would be afraid to take it. Many saints would not take this. So would a Buddhist monk smoke salvia and just laugh? And that's the question I kind of want to end, end this on. Uh, all my references and sources are available on this uh, URL. It's just easier than putting them all up here. If you want to learn more about the philosophy of idealism, I really highly recommend these two books by Bernardo Castro. Uh, and these are two great books to get an introduction to Buddhism uh, for a Western audience. Thank you.